Welcome to the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast, hosted by your favorite duo, Stephen and Charlene. They're here to help you transform your mindset and create a positive outlook on life. Are you tired of feeling stuck and unfulfilled? Are you ready to take control of your thoughts and emotions and rewrite your story? Well, you're in the right place. They will be sharing inspiring stories, practical tips, and expert advice to help you on your journey to a better you. You'll learn how to let go of negative self-talk, embrace your strengths, and focus on the good things in life. Each episode will be joined by amazing guests who have rewritten their own life stories and are now living their best lives. From successful entrepreneurs to accomplished athletes, we'll bring you stories of resilience, courage, and triumph. So grab a cup of coffee, get cosy, and get ready to be inspired. Tune in every week for a new episode of the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast. Let's rewrite our stories together and make every day count. In this episode, we're interviewing Dr. Catherine Vecchio. As the Executive Director of the Vecchio Group, Art for the Heart, Catherine Vecchio has witnessed firsthand how using art and groups significantly, positively impacts mental health. Join us today as we delve into the, her story. Before we get started, we want to remind you that the information presented in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and their guests are their own and do not represent the views of any organisation or entity. Additionally, any information presented should not be taken as legal, medical or financial advice. Always consult with a licensed professional in the respective field for any advice or guidance. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's dive into today's topic and learn how to transform our lives through positive thinking and taking control of our stories. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin, we want to give you a heads up. We may be discussing some sensitive and personal topics that might bring up some strong emotions or discomfort. Our goal is to create a safe and supportive space, but we know that everyone's experiences and triggers are different. If you start feeling overwhelmed or triggered during an episode, remember to prioritize your well-being. It's totally okay to hit pause and take a break. Your self-care is important and looking after your mental and emotional health should always come first. If you ever need extra support, we encourage you to reach out to a mental health professional or someone you trust. You're not alone, and there are resources available to help you on your personal journey. Thank you for joining us on this incredible ride with the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast. Together, we'll navigate life's challenges and rewrite our narratives with strength and resilience. Hey, it's Stephen and Charlene, and we're here with the Rewrite Your Life Story, and I'm really excited today. We've got Dr. Catherine Becker all the way from Columbia, Ohio. And Dr. Catherine has a very interesting, diverse story. So I'm really excited to dive into it. But she's also the founder of the Vecchio Group and the Art for the Heart Foundation. So we're going to delve right into what that is a little bit later. But first of all, welcome, Dr. Catherine. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And Dr. Catherine, let's go right to the beginning. Tell us your story as a child growing up in a Sicilian household and how that formed your life? Well, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio with, at the time, lots of ethnic pockets, very rich. And I will tell you my first image as a kid, we grew up across the street from a house with five boys, the Jones boys, Southern Baptist, all little redhead Welsh boys. And there across the street, Mr. Vecchio with his two daughters, Sicilian. And we were really good friends. Our families were just loved each other. And I just grew up steeped in the culture. I mean, just large family gatherings every Sunday and really steeped in the Catholic church. And I had this heart for God from a very early age. And My father went to Italy and came back with a gold pinky ring. I still wear it, actually. And I said, Dad, can I have it made for my ring finger? And he was like, happy. And he goes, why? And I said, like the nuns, I want to marry the church. I was like 10 years old. He's like, oh, my gosh, I want you to be committed to the church because that's like how we all are. But I wasn't. It was because I think it all fit together. 
my family, our values. It felt secure and safe and made sense. So that was sort of the underpinning of my life and identity. But in school, much darker skin, very curly hair. That was not at all what the ideal was back then. We weren't looking at more exotic looks. And as I was saying, when The Godfather came out, it changed. I mean, I remember really being bullied. You're a grease ball, you're deported. And I remember my father saying, you know, your cousins all of a sudden, they come up with these accents and they're not even, because he didn't like it. And I remember the Italian American Federation because we really try to eliminate that. But what's so interesting, right, is that that flipped the general consensus. And yet they're criminals. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of what the book is a lot about and how I experienced it. My father was a businessman in Cleveland. He was very well known and things. And all of a sudden it was very cool. But it influenced my life, and I've taken my kids back to Italy when I looked at adoption, looked at adopting in Italy. That's almost impossible. And just, yeah, it's just been the inform my life. And the main part, too, is that my father only had an eighth grade education. Both of my parents came from poverty, which was when people immigrated here. That was generally what happened. But they fought for education. And for my sister and I and cousins, it was simply not an option not to go all the way through graduate school and graduate school and graduate school and go to the extent of what your potential was because they saw that as the way out. And I respect it because we came from peasants and I remember I didn't know that my dad even knew what summa cum laude or magna cum laude or graduate degrees were, really. He's very bright, but I just didn't know that. And he was so proud. And I think of all the moments in his life when my sister and I walked, it was really proud. So I think that's why I just was kept going through school and then ended up in seminary. Yeah. And I can see through your bio. You really are a student. You have many qualifications and art. So it's definitely something that's deep in your values. It's real love for learning, isn't there? Yeah. You mentioned adoption and you tried to adopt in Italy. Do you want to speak into that, how that occurred in your life? Yeah. Well, infertility was really difficult for me. It's difficult for most women. Um, and my father had died very suddenly. It was extremely traumatic and then discovered the infertility. And right from the beginning, it was very small chance that anything would work. But I'm an athlete. I was a triathlete. I was like, okay, do I have a half of a 1%? Well, then I got something, right? Now I'm going to cross the finish line. It doesn't work that way at all. And um I pounded it and pounded it and pounded it. And part of it is that meaning pounded it with the medical and medical and medical. And looking back on it, what I realized at 61 years old, I couldn't do it. Surrendering on that issue. And I've been through a thing or two that most people would say bigger than that. No, for me, no. That was the pivotal piece. And so we went through everything all the way to donor egg, which I will say to you, I'm not proud of this, but I share this if it helps someone. In the beginning, we felt that that was crossing a line morally. And so a red flag is a stop sign, right? There was a red flag somewhere around and IVF, when I really knew that it was my will, I was pressing my will. God made it just abundantly clear. And those are the moments in my life where I say, that's where probably that's like the dark night of the soul for me, where I go, I hear your voice. 
I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to run the show. And fortunately for us, the road played as it did, but it was just incredibly painful and really took a toll on our marriage. And then because I did a lot of work in my private practice with young girls who were pregnant and were placing for adoption, there was a local attorney that took a lot of those cases and placed those babies. And so I knew her. My my husband was ready to do it long before I was. And I called her. And it wasn't long after that, my admin called from the front desk. And she buzzes me and she says, I think this is the call. And I was like, yeah, right. And they, the social worker gives me the information. And she says, he was born last night. And I go, what? Last night? And my partner comes scurrying over. He goes, this is the 10-year pregnancy. And we've all been screaming, push. Like, is the baby really coming? And Jacob was born. And we picked him up two days later because it was Memorial Day. And so we couldn't with the court and it was utterly shocking and amazing and also shocking because infertility adoption, talk about, oh, wonderful. Well, you don't have a nursery. It's also really different. And it's really good to have people in your life that get all that. So it was wonderful. And then it was not legal to have open adoption. So I had an anonymous, like a phone call with Jacob's birth mother and, you know, not exchanging last names. And um, she said, are you going to have more children? And I said, I hope I've been trying, you know, I want, and almost immediately, because I did want siblings for him, but I knew, I thought, she's going to get pregnant again. I have a feeling. And I went for a run with Jacob and I came back. That was 14 months later. And um, my sister was there <laughs> and she said, Jacob's sister's waiting for her. Oh. Wow. So it's just like people say, the immediacy of the bond. I carried Jacob in a papoose for nine months because I was like, hey, man, I'm going to make this up. I'm like, hey, let's see how it goes if that like helps. But my children are just kind and loving. And now I get to do this work, which I utterly love the kids I work with. I feel like I was saying, you know, I get to put my arms around all these kids and love them. And I do. And I can't even imagine retiring ever. So it's funny. You think it's a dead end and it feels like it. For me, it did. And it's a detour, but it's like literally a dead end. And don't lose hope for anybody out there going through it. Let God use one other story to say, hang on, because he's in the details. He's watching. He's in it all the time. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable and sharing your heart. We really feel you. So thank you so much. So you've adopted two siblings, which is absolutely beautiful. I've always questioned, and obviously this podcast was birthed out of mine and Charlene's story around infertility and our journey. And we did look at adoption and we decided that because of the laws and the way it works in Australia, it wasn't an option for us. But do you want to talk into nurture versus nature and that connection that you have with your children? Like, do you feel that nurture is more important than nature, not being your biological children? And how did that play out for you? It's stunning to me to see how my son has mannerisms and my daughter too, of my ex-husband. We're divorced now, but it's amazing. And it's really funny because my son, he's hilarious. I just don't know if I can be around you and Sarah. I call, her name for me is Birdie. You and Birdie are just way too much alike. And we are, and more so than many of my friends who have biological children. Why? I don't know. I know my ex-husband and I are very close to our kids. We're still their parents. We're not their friends, but we all like each other. Like I could honestly say I would pick my kids as friends 
if they are my friends, but I always say you only have one mom or in their case, a birth mom and myself. But so I stay in my lane, but we really like each other. But I know from what I know about psychology and science and all of that, that genetics are a big part of it. I just know anecdotally with my children, it's stunning. And our birth mother and father picked us from one of these books that had the pictures and the explanation. And we're told that we look a lot like the birth parents. We haven't seen them because it was closed, but it makes sense, right? That people pick people that look and have similar interests and so forth. So yeah, my children have no interest in looking up any of it, if they do, I tell them, I hate roller coasters. I'm like, if you want, I'll ride a roller coaster with your birth family, whatever works. But it's just not something that has ever really been of interest, although they've known from the beginning about adoption. So oh, that's quite powerful. Obviously, you're Italian, Italian heritage, and I'm an Italian background. And so culture and morals play such a big part in everything we do. I'm just curious. Do your children identify as Italian? It's so funny because my children are very, very light skin. In fact, I say they're clear. <laughs> Their skin is so, and they're always like, mommy, you're so darker skin. So we did our DNA and my mind, Cicely, we have a lot of African-American blood. And it was just my little pie chart had like really cool little things. and his was almost entirely Welsh. Well, my undergrad was British history. So I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. He goes, well, I don't know. Yours is more colorful. I thought, well, literally, I guess. <laughs> and I said, well, hey, the cool thing is you get to pick. And this came to us through adoption, right? And he points to the Vecchio one. And they very much identify as Vecchio's in that there's a lot of isms that are very much Italian isms that they and I, as a philosophy, psychologically, and it's even kind of the new movement in it, the forget about it, which is positive psychology, like forward thinking, the old stuff of the psychodynamic, the back, and that is important to a certain extent. The forget about it. My son will often say, all right, mom, I'll do anything for that person. But do I have to sit in a feeling circle? Because like we used to always talk about feelings. He goes, let's just do the Vecchio thing. Forget about it. Let's have fun and have some pasta. There's something to that. I mean, really. And my kids are very funny and they spend a lot of their time giving to other people, which to me is the secret sauce. So Fast forward to now, you do a lot of work with children and you have have a foundation. Do you want to speak what your work is around children and what you actually do? I wondered at this point in my life, what could I give my kids instead of it's an inheritance of money? And what's the thread of all the populations I've worked with? Death row inmates I've worked with, autism, addicts, suburban families wealthy people, you know, all over the map. And yet there's this threat. And I often think about the death row inmates because their situation is so different, but there's always been this connection. And I was running a group of kids on the spectrum one day, and I would always ask, what do you think is the most important work of art? And this little girl said, Dr. Campy, your life. And I went, that's it. Your life is the work of art, and that's the thread. God created every single one of us and our circumstances, our circumstances, like everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be, but it's unique. And so we each have to figure out before God, with God, it's a work of art to figure that out. And when I've worked with people, it's not like this is the formula with a death row inmate. This is the formula autism. It's every situation, every blended family, all of it. They have to imagine a solution and then create it. So we use art 
to peak imagination so that people who feel like it's in the ditch can first imagine the Sandy Hook. I remember watching that. I'm a very positive psychology flip things. I'm watching it on television. And I thought, now, how is it possible, God? How is it even possible to find a way to live with that, live with it, not just live with joy? How does that happen? And then I'm watching when they went to court to the radio announcer who was had liability. And they talk about this foundation that the parents started called Love Wins and Post-Traumatic Stress Growth, not Disorder. And the way that they coped with this, they imagined a whole different way, which is Love Wins, not the old post-traumatic stress disorder. This is how we do it. They imagined something outside the box. They had a blank canvas and they painted something outside the box. And now they're living in joy in such a way that they're not fighting against circumstances, if that makes sense at all. And so I started thinking two things. I thought how to bring that to people who are either underserved or don't have access to art. And then what can I give my kids as a legacy? And they both have a heart for kids of people who are disabled, underserved, hurting. And I thought they could run this foundation. That would be the thing I would want to give them in any kind of way. So I've gotten the energy and the passion to do this. And we've been running groups and doing this work for even during COVID. So using art and is pretty amazing that we were able to succeed on screen with it, but it's powerful. It really is. I'm actually stunned and we're collecting data to actually show the measurable results because they are. And I want people to see that it moves the needle, really does. I do think that that's one of, if not the thing, when we feel like we're different or we're in the ditch and can't get a way out. That's very powerful. Sounds like what you're doing at the moment is allowing people to think outside of their current situation and imagine a different situation for themselves. Right. What specifically? Art is an expression. So does the participant have free choice in the art they choose or are they guided? Like what specifically does the program entitle? So most people say I'm not an artist, but the first piece is for people to understand that your canvas can be cooking, rock climbing, dance. Tell me that Pele is not poetry, you know, with a soccer ball, right? It's poetry. A surgeon who's doing microsurgery, come on, is there artistry to that? Of course. So it's not to just say, slap that title on anything. It's really think about what art is and then help people understand what is your canvas? I said to a friend, she loves redesigning my house. I said, well, my house is your canvas. And she was like, I never thought of that. I just thought, I'm not an artist. I said, are you kidding me? You're a million times more creative than I could be. So that's number one is the goal. We have 20 weeks of different exposures to all the different mediums. And I provide a box that has every single supply, including a pencil eraser, so that you take the box, you can create during the session or when we're not in the session, and you have everything you need so that it's not difficult to be creative because it's hard enough to decide you're going to take some time to do it. And then you have a dried out marker. You can't find your mark. It's like you got to have the stuff. And then for people with executive functioning problems, issues like autism, ADD, addiction, because the brain is just not working straight. This really helps. It's organized. And we expose to all different kinds of mediums, all different kinds of art form. Now what I've been doing is using 
artists in the communities and doing community engagement, because that's really the peak of connection. And that's the antidote to addiction. It's not sobriety, it's connection. So now we're using local artists and then, boy, we took this one kid. Oh my gosh, it was amazing at a pottery studio that is just two years ago, isolation, hostility, and thriving. And actually on his own, went back to the studio. So now he sees, oh, there's an artist in the community. Who knew? You know, I mean, kids don't realize that right here in our city, there's a little potter who has a little artist studio. You've also done a lot of work with veterans. How has that journey been? I went to do and went through the integrated medicine program and through some of my cohorts in that Fort Bragg is not far from Durham, which is where I was living. And we got a contract to work with those soldiers to prepare them for deployment. Now I had worked with veterans in groups with a homeless and getting them ready or reintegrating them when they were having acute issues. But this was a really unique contract. And so we prepared them for deployment, but we were only given four sessions, young men leaving their families and women, 19 years old, and learning the exact opposite emotional, cognitive thoughts that they had attempted to learn their whole life. And I was standing there talking with the colonel and we were talking about how he couldn't get funding for reentry of these same soldiers. And it just stunning to me. And I don't think that civilians quite really understand what it means to be a professional soldier, deploy for two years, come back, your children aren't the same kids that you left. Yeah. And now you're on. You're not given reentry. I mean, if you think about it, people have reentry from vacation, right? You know what I mean? When you come back from vacation, it takes a minute. Can you imagine? So I just have a heart, and my family all served, my mother served, and we felt like we were Americans, not just Italians or Italian Americans, because we served. And my uncle, was awarded the Silver Star. I mean, we very, very much devoted to that. So the more I work with veterans, the more I understand just how, what a sacrifice, incredible sacrifice they make for us. Yeah, thank you for what you do. So Catherine, what is the Integrated Medicine Health Coaching? Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, my interest in it was as the field of personal development, psychology, all of that started to shift as coaching became more popularized. I wanted to get really solid certifications in that and explore that. So Duke University started the first integrative medicine health coaching program, and I was right there. So I went through it and got certified. The process is really around this idea of preventative medicine, acute medicine, and holistic medicine, where the whole person from relationship, career, and the physical being is all looked at as a whole, and all of the practitioners involved in treating an individual and in impacting an individual is looked at as a whole. And what I have found in treating people or kids that have teachers and a learning coach and a psychologist and a psychiatrist, I do treatment team meetings. I have everybody involved because so often everyone's working in silos. So integrative medicine is really focused on that kind of work and then helping the client understand if you're in a job where it's constant stress, if a mistake's made, it's all about blame, not, hey, let's fix it. Because mistakes, that's what happens. <laughs> What's expected? 
that's a different physical feeling in your body than most of us that get a stomach ache in that environment, or you know what I mean? Or by the end of the day, you have a headache. That impacts your physical health. And over time, blood flow stops. Literally, like that kind of stuff impacts your health. So looking at all of that, and it also is quality of life. I think like infertility, as dark as it was for me, it was an opportunity. And had I gone through an integrative medicine or with an integrated medicine practitioner, I think I would have gotten unstuck a lot sooner because the spiritual component is there as well. And when that broke open, that's when I was able to surrender and embrace this whole new way of thinking that I couldn't have imagined before. You know, Dr. Catherine, you speak about surrender and often people see surrender as a weakness, but it's actually a strength, isn't it? Well, absolutely. Just like I'm sorry is to me the most profound vulnerable and powerful. People at the end of their life are found to have joy are the people that are willing to be vulnerable. People who are not report less joy. People who are willing to be vulnerable may have more heartbreak, but they report more joy. But it's really hard. And I just apologized to someone recently and they didn't accept the apology. That's hard. That's really hard. It hurts. And that was exactly where I needed to be and surrender to that. But I totally agree. Like the first step in AA is surrender and then you're set free. There then begins your work. I completely agree that that is strength and also it's freedom. Wow. Beautifully put. Thank you so much. You're now writing a book or in the process almost finished, and it's called La Vecchia Via. What inspired you to write this book? It means no more the old road. And I love that because every day for me, I feel like I'm inspired by the idea, no more the old road of the things that I learned from yesterday is the old road. And now I have, I get a mulligan this time. My son is a golf pro. <laughs> and so I love the metaphors, a mulligan, a do-over. I love it because I get another mulligan the next day and then I get a do-over. And Michelangelo at 84, well, you probably heard this, right? What makes your painting so great? Still learning. It's not the old road. It's a new road today. Okay. That idea inspires me. And that Sicilian, it's a caste system in Italy. And my people were impoverished and decided that they could not live the old road and then left Sicily and fought for something more. And there then even began a journey of real despair. I mean, there were lots of lynchings of Sicilians in America in the 20s and a lot of issues that we dealt with, but that's the genesis of it. And what I weave into it is a lot of the Italian culture and looking at the Godfather effect and how just, I do think it's an interesting idea how we celebrate criminals in movies, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, for example, and being Sicilian that affected me so personally I find it rather interesting. What role have mentors played in rewriting your story so many times? I think without that, I don't know that I almost feel like it would be hard to still be kicking it just individually, much less to me to have the thought that I could say anything or just walk alongside someone with the hope to help them is such a bold act of responsibility. I say to anyone, if you're a sponsor in AA, if you do anything that's helping people, 
check yourself. It's really important because it's just sticky stuff. It's great stuff, but it's really important to check yourself. So I've always had coaches, mentors. I feel like I've had the best supervisors and that's made all the difference as well in my career. People that are 30 years ahead of me down the road that can tell me not just professionally their experience, but personally how to navigate a messy world. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And I can see that you've rewritten your story in so many areas, so many facets. And I don't know if the podcast or one hour of your time is actually going to do it complete justice, but you mentioned being vulnerable and checking yourself. And that just comes out so richly throughout this podcast and you're telling your story. So thank you for your own vulnerability as well. You've taken us on quite an adventure today, Dr. Catherine, from the way you were brought up to the struggles that you've been through and how you've overcome that throughout your life. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to rewrite their own life? I think that the most important thing is to recognize connection is the most important thing. It gives you perspective. It gives you an opportunity to give to someone else. I'm kind of a hippie. I don't like rules. In fact, I tend to like buck up against a rule. I write my notes and crayons and markers, but I have a rule. And the rule is if you want to be involved in my programs, you must have a volunteer commitment. And each volunteer commitment is unique to the person. And it's something that they can always do. It's not like going to the soup kitchen. It's a personal thing that you can do the rest of your life. Like one of the kiddos, really a sweetheart, loves animals. She's making little catnip sachets and taking them to the pound. And I believe so strongly that when we get outside ourselves and we can say, could I use my pain to help someone else? For me, it's been years ago that I went through the infertility, but talking about it today with the hope that I could bless in one droplet someone else, to me, just gives me so much hope and joy. When I get a paycheck, that's what I always say. I say, this is a cheat that I get paid for what I do. I mean, and I really feel like that. So that's what I would say. Like, you have to connect and pay it forward. Otherwise, there is purpose in our pain. There really is. There's a way we can use it. And that's the way to get out of how painful it can be. Wow. Yeah. Profound. I love that. There is purpose in our pain. So, Dr. Catherine, if you could go back and rewrite your own life story, what would that look like now? I would be kinder. I would have been sometimes less Italian. (laughs) 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 And maybe sometimes more Italian. I had a hard time finding my way with asserting myself and my confidence as a woman in leadership roles. That is hard. But I would listen more and talk less. I think I probably would have grieved less about losing my father the way that I did in that I lost him very, very suddenly for a really long time. I grieved that I couldn't say goodbye to him and I didn't surrender to there was purpose in this. And now I'm losing my mother to Alzheimer's and it goes on and on and on. And I said to someone the other day, you know, I get it now. My dad died with an exclamation point. And that was exactly perfect for him. And I spent a lot of time grieving that that was where I was. That was my process. It takes what it takes. But looking back, I see now how I would receive that differently, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? And for a long time, I thought of the death. And I also said to this person, Yeah, my dad had a life, not a death. That's exactly right. It was like this exclamation point, and it was all about that. And it was. It was a fantabulous life. I mean, death is predictable, right? I mean, none of us get out of here alive. It's the cool life that's not predictable. 
And he did that. So that would be one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Catherine, it's been a pleasure having you on the Rewrite Your Life Story podcast. And I've definitely connected in so many levels. And I know the audience is going to really resonate with what you've said today. And if you want to know more about Dr. Catherine and her work, her links will be in the show notes and you can follow her and please support her foundation in any way you can as well and follow her on socials. Dr. Catherine, thank you once again. Now that we've interviewed our guest, join Charlene and I as we recap today's episode. I just loved the different perspective that Dr. Catherine brought to that. It was such an amazing journey that she has taken us from her very beginnings. Like her Italian heritage is just so rich, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And she really has a passion for it. So I love some of the key points. Like I never knew that I guess I'm not very creative myself. Well, I'm creative in different ways. So art's never been my thing, but it's been definitely yours. You know, you like to color in and do mandalas and things like that. So learning about healing through art was quite interesting for me. Yeah, and the wonderful thing that I noticed that she mentioned that it's not all just about painting or drawing. It's about different art forms, isn't it? Not just like those main stereotypical things of art. I think my key takeaways throughout her story, obviously the emotion of the adoption is so real, even after so many years. And that was just beautiful. You can really see her mother's heart for her children there. That's right. I love the statement she said, could I use my pain to help someone else? Yeah, that was just profound. And that's really what Rewrite Your Life Story is about, is sharing stories that could help someone else. And heal. And heal, yeah. And the other thing she said is, is there a purpose for my pain? Yeah. We don't ask ourselves that in the moment. Like we're so caught up in it. We get so fixated on how things are right here and right now. And we forget to ask ourselves, what is the purpose behind this? What can I learn from it? Thank you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you found it informative and inspiring. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and share it with your friends and family. Also, make sure to visit our website at www.rewriteyourlifestory.com.au to learn more about our mission, products and services. And remember, you have the power to rewrite your own life story. So go out there, face your challenges head on and create the life you've always wanted. We'll see you in the next episode.